It's been a great day. I'm learning, I'm sharing my ideas. Hopefully you've met the people. I'll see you next few days. This is my keynote. Very fortunate to have John Stevens, who's the CTO of Sigil. Uh, made a, a very interesting post several months ago, which I thought was uh, extremely interesting. I invited him to join us here today. Uh, I was a little reluctant because of the potential for controversy. However, I assured him that this audience wants to learn and wants to hear the answers today. Yeah, John! Woo! Yeah. <laughs> so, let's I'm also signing James book. Immediately after this, Guest house as the director of the club, the over the house of the reception, lots of fantastic human beings. Actually, it's one day we'll be back, right? Yes. So, first, before we get going, a quick thank you to all the volunteers that have helped us, all those orange shirt folks, and all the planners, and just all of you who took the time to come and make this success. It's another day of it tomorrow. So, without further ado, John, thank you. Can everybody hear me in the back? No. Yes. Is that good? No? Someone said no? No, we're recording. No, we're recording. Same kind of thing. Outstanding. Okay. Um, my name is John, as you mentioned. Um, just by way of uh, introduction, I've been uh, I've been working on this um, for 20 years now. So everything from incident response when it was easy uh, and reversing uh, to building people's programs. And so, um, you know, what I want to kind of talk about is is um, you know, how I've really stopped worrying uh, about, you know, all of the things that we've learned today, unfortunately, all the, um, the good tools and techniques we have to try to find problems and actually worry about uh, trying to fix fix the damn software. So, uh, you know, you are what you, you, you focus on, what you pay attention to. And if you look at the talk breakdown here, uh, this is a breaker con, right? We have a lot of talks on breaking. Um, I will hand it to the organizers. Um, Ten is the most I've counted ever. So, uh, you know, that's, that's, a good, that's a good breakdown, but it's still only a third. Um, and so, you know, we are what we focus on. So I'm going to try to, um, I'm going to try to shift the focus here today. Um, you simply cannot test your application to secure. When you get a report and it has 20 critical findings in it, how much more secure are you? Yes. Nothing until you fix it, exactly. Um, it's interesting, a lot of security products claim to fix your code. There's not just one, there's a bunch. If you look, they'll, you know, we'll test, we'll find, and we'll fix your code. Are, are, they, are they writing your code? They... Um, and so, you know, this actually turns out to be very hard. We've got to switch that. We've got to turn that corner. And um, as I mentioned, I've been doing this for, for a long time. And so I have a lot of, um, I have a lot of assessment data that may, may even shock you. Um, we simply can't test our application secure, and we know this uh, because our data show it. So we, we do hundreds of assessments um, uh, a month, maybe even, uh, certainly thousands and thousands a year. Um, and what we find is that when someone asks us to test them again, I fixed it. I just fixed it, test it again. 67% of the time, we can break it with the exact same test. Okay, no changes. Um, if they let us actually look at the application and do something different to test whatever control they have in place, whatever they think they made, ninety-eight percent of the time we break it. Okay, so so we're a little bit challenged, right, with regards to this this, this remediation process here. Um, and you know, there's a lot of talk now uh, about band-aiding apps. So there are a variety of different things out there. There's there's RASP tools. There's libraries. Things like that. Um, there's WAFs. We're WAF in front of it, right? That's that's going to be the solution where firewall wasn't. Firewalls network. WAFs can do the applications can solve the problem. Um, we have a 100% uh, re-exploit rate uh, when a WAF is put in place uh, after one of our assessments. 100%. Yeah. Um, so. That's wild, right? I mean, it's no value, right? Now, I think that there are values to us. 
I, I think that they're a valuable tool. Um, but obviously, they are not helping us with our security posture in this case. Um, 77% of the rules is doing it. Um, oh, right, outstanding. So um, this, this re-expert rate includes when the WAC rules themselves were handcrafted to defeat our specific tests. So um, again, not very effective. Now, uh, what's worse is, and, and you see this a lot in the, in the analyst space right now, um, there's a lot of heat around some better mousetraps out there. Right, WAFs have become RASP, testing has become IAST, uh, and these better these, these better mousetraps are going to solve your problem. I assure you, they're not. Um, they're not because those that are simply testing the application are still just filing out bugs. Now, is that to say that you know you shouldn't buy one of those tools? Well, maybe you should. If you're the kind of organization that does some looking at the code over here. And you're the kind of organization that does some breaking the you know the application over here in production, uh, and you don't let those two people, those two groups of people talk, um, you're not getting as much value out of either of those activities as you could if they were combined. And so yes, we are making improvements to the way we test. <coughs> but understand that when we test the application, we're still the deliverable is bugs. Um, this slide is drawn to scale. Um, so. There are um, some stuff that you know we, we found dynamically, and this is um, since 2004. This is data aggregate from all of my assessment practice from 2004 on. So there's stuff that dynamic tests can find, and there's stuff that static tests can find, and there's a small overlap there. And then you know 60% of what my organization finds when it tests is what we call design flaws. Design flaws are, 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 are different than a single cross-site scripting problem. Um, it may be something like the profound misuse of cryptography, um, or, or you know, like trust concerns between components that break down. Um, and and so you know, when we test, or even when we test with one of these new tools, we're still going to be missing a whole class of problems. Um, and what's interesting about this is, you know, what are, what are the OWASP top three? What are the top three problems that we really fixate on? SQL injection, probably one of the top three, right? Where are some of the others? Cross-site scripting. Session management stuff, yeah. C surf. Right? Where's where's the um, where's the crypto stuff? Where's the authentication stuff? Where's the authorization stuff? Where's the stuff on parameter pollution that gets you in the front page because someone else's account came up? There's a lot of really key problems that may be design related that aren't on that short list, and that short list is what's driving the tools and the assessment factors of it. So unfortunately, I'm not selling, um, I'm not selling a tool or a service or, or consulting that can help you with these things. Uh, instead, I'd actually like you to look inside your own organization. And um, I think there are some things that I found uh, now looking at um, over 98 security initiatives uh, that I think you would find valuable. Um, and these three things are things that the organizations that we have helped or that we have measured their security initiatives say are, the, are, are some of the key things to their success. So the first thing is getting a big red button, a way to stop as a security person, a way to stop promotion into production. David talked about this, I think, um, earlier. David wrote his presentation. Uh, others had in the past. Um, you know, then of course there's been a lot of talk of um, secure guidance, um, secure coding, uh, again Jim's book, right? Uh, and uh, this can take a lot of forms. We'll talk about it. Um, and then doing some more intelligent design to meet the needs of those flaws um, through your development frameworks. So this is a bunch of words. Let me just summarize it for you. What's really worked for the organizations we've talked to that are confident in their security groups? is that they've gotten involved enough in producing software that they can actually stop it from going to production. So they're providing that kind of quality um, uh, of governance. And they're part of that game because they're actually helping people code securely and they're affecting the design in a way that accelerates development. Right? So 
you're starting to hear some of this come out in DevOps right, as well. And what's interesting about it is that in the DevOps world, um, what, I, what I hear is it's a lot of focus on culture and it's a lot of focus on people. And those are great focuses because without those two things, qualified people and a cultural match, you can't succeed. But I'm not going to tell you anything about that because trying to change an organization's culture is kind of like showing up as a missionary um, in a native land, in a, in a hostile land, to trying to convert. And I don't want to get eaten. Um, but there are plenty of great presentations, David's to be added, uh, from the Alaska community and other communities that talk about this person, this cultural, um, uh, you know, the things that are making you successful in doing that. Um, and so I've listened up here, you get the slides, you can, I mean, you can Google this stuff. Uh, really great presentations, but certainly, please, find something that's going to work for your organization culturally. We have a saying at my company, um, security activities are like organs. We all have a liver, but if I try to take mine out and give it to you, it's going to be, it's going to be a rough you know, transplant, right? And so, so rather than looking at what your neighbor is doing or your competitor is doing and try to wholesale import that transplant, work with what you have. I'm also going to punt the second thing, secure guidance. Um, and the reason I'm going to punt it is because um, it's very hands-on, it's very artistic, and it's really hard to scale. Um, but I'm going to give you some tricks, I hope, um, that can help you with it. And so what we're going to focus on here is uh, the intelligent design for frameworks, and I'm hoping that that ekes us back into the world of secure coding guidance. Um, for what it's worth, if you happen to be at RSA, uh, I'm going to be giving, I think, a four-hour training session on identity access management um, and how to build that stuff securely. Um, right. So if I want to talk about frameworks, you know, again, we, um, I gathered these particular items and, and some of these techniques from what's called the BSIM survey, which is where we looked at uh, security initiatives. And so I could go through and tell you that these are the activities you have to adopt and you know, this is where you have to get your, you know, your stuff, and this is how you have to patch it. I don't want to talk about that. Instead, I want to issue a challenge. Um, and I think this challenge is going to be very hard. But it's one we have to start meeting right now, and it's one we have to start meeting head on. Um, what is a good security framework and what is a bad one? We need to immediately start holding ourselves to this account, and it's this. We need to give guidance and write code that, of course, secure by default, Right? Um, we need to prefer automatically applied controls to those that we invent and then ask the developer to remember. Yeah, John! Yeah, good security frameworks just give it to the developer automatically. Bad security frameworks demand the developers remember to call it and call it correctly and call it everywhere they need to call it and check it for the right reason. I mean, how many, how many people have done an assessment and someone's signing when they should have been encrypting or vice versa? You know, um, so in other words, uh, you know, your security guidance needs to be correct, but I promise you the long pole in the tent of getting secure code into production is actually making it usable. And so let's go with the, you know, the best buy monster cable upsell metaphor here, right? There's the good, there's the good, there's the better and the best monster cable. I still haven't figured out what the difference is. Uh, there's a one, it's 50 bucks or 100 bucks. Right? So, so, yeah, but let's, let's just go with this for a moment uh, and see where it takes us. So, what's the good cable, right? What's, what's, the, what's, the, what's, the, what's the, the, uh, the entry level feature? Well, we can help developers, we as developers can write some custom code, we can write some features and functions. Like, this is what a SAPI is, right? It's, 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 a, it's, it's a bag of things you can call, and we hope that those things are well written, and we're excited about it, because we wrote those things to security people, and so we think we got them right. So we're abstracting the hard subject matter expert into a function, and we're gonna make people call it, and that's a good thing, right? But unfortunately, it's gotta be our least preferred good thing. Right? Because again, it has those, those bad properties that we will talk about soon. There are ways that we can write uh, or use frameworks using the properties of the languages we know and love. Things like inheritance or annotation or metaprogramming. We want to be fancy. 
And you know, maybe you've seen some of this in some of the web development frameworks. There's a base class, and that base class may help you dis distribute, you know, uh, authenticated functionality, um, or it may give you form data that's already been um, handled, encoded in some way, right? And so there are there are you know a second tier up, a, a better monster table, a better security framework would be one where the programmer is getting some of the you know some of the functionality that you wrote, but that it's Encapsulated inside of the um, inside of the design, and so you know they they, they kind of just have to call um, or extend the right classes. Uh, even better than that is services, microservices. Um, so uh, for organizations that are concerned about PCI, right? Uh, a lot of organizations um, five years ago, ten years ago, that were concerned about PCI basically built this like gerbil hamster maze of encryption. You know, every system's got to you know encrypt it and then pass it to someone else who decrypts it and you know, there were, there were just, you have 50 systems, you have 100 encryption problems to solve, and all the keys associated with it. Well, some organizations have said, yeah, we could write those encryption functions and distribute them to developers in the library, or we could write a tokenization service, we could take the credit card, we could have a service tokenize it immediately and pass the token around, them. and then when you need to bill, you can refer to the tokenization service and get the information you need yesterday. A very good question, especially for encryption, do you think that a component is enough, or is it more of a, or, or where do you place componentization versus isolation and putting in a separate service and keeping it out of the app versus just providing a separate component for encryption? Uh, Jim has asked me a fairly hard question, which is um, how well do you have to encapsulate um, your, your, your encryption uh, tech that you're going to distribute? Can it just be a component? Does it have to be a service? Do I get that right? Yes. Um, I, I mean, so it's the reason this question is unfair is because it depends. Encryption is a class of things. Um, you know, the kinds of encryption problems that developers suffer with key uh, creation, key management, key escrow, uh, key distribution is a different kind of design abstraction than is a simple symmetric or asymmetric encryption problem. Is a different kind of problem than a say request signing secret. And so. You know, for cir circumstances where you would want to tokenize, that's been uh, really uh, effectively distributed as a microservice in architectures recently, whereas uh, things like the key management and secret management, uh, sensitive information management, uh, has been part of the build tools. Uh, and has actually been distributed as part of, you know, the, the scripts that go along with containerization of your application so that as the application is built, it gets the right kind of encryption um, material for the sensitivity and handling of that material for the, the environment, it's, it's, it's bound for. Um, that was a lot of words, I'm sorry. So the point is, though, that you know the difference between, I guess, to, to wrap this up for, for the rest of you, uh, the difference between a component uh, and a service is really the extent to which it is, is packaged and abstracted. You know, a component, you still got to like download and integrate against and manage. In a service, in theory, we're talking about something um, you know, more restful, more asynchronous, more at arm's length, you have to worry about it less. Uh, back to the PCI example, if you had an encryption component to handle things, you know, you'd still have to integrate that with 50 systems. In theory, if you've got a tokenization, you may, you may take your surface down to three systems, uh, which you have to integrate with that surface and the rest are not realized. Um, there's stuff you can just configure away. I mean, if, if you guys are um, into uh, Python and you've done Django apps, um, you know that basically when you set up your Django project, there's a bunch of configuration you can get right, and a lot of security posture just comes along with it. Um, and so that's a great um, way to have extracted the functionality down to where it can be easily configured uh, and hopefully configured secure by default. Um, beyond that, there's convention. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the authorization maps, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, the authorization annotations in Spring, um, you know, taking the top of the method and saying this must be, you must be authorized to enter this. Um, conventions such as um, some of the um, contextually aware libraries. Um, these are uh, a great abstraction because saying, all right, we've taken the functionality and we've basically encapsulated it uh, in a way that is now going to be natural for you to use in the languages you're already using. Um, and then finally, uh, the holy grail of getting a security framework right is when the platform provides it. So 
Platform provided security. You're not going to buffer overflow a Java program. The platform provides you memory management. You have won. The developer cannot screw it up. Um, caveat, if you want to know how to buffer overflow a VM, fuck me later. But, um, you know, and, and, you know, this also extends to security controls. You know, one of the big differences between the Spring Framework 3 and the Spring Framework 4 is that they've gone from a situation where there's some configuration associated with password management to the platforms providing the security by default in a way that would definitely withstand attack and would withstand security audit. So platform provided is the win. So now we've got that set of monster cases, right? We go from having written a function to platform provision, and the challenge to this audience is let's get the stuff into the platform. It's not going to happen with everything, but let's get as far up that continuum so that it's automatic as possible. And I'm gonna, the rest of this is going to be about that. So let's look at a SAPI um, uh, uh, as a case study for this. So we have a training app uh, inside my company. We call it the Bank of Insecurities. Um, and here's some code that it handles uh, login through, right? So unsurprisingly, it checks if the user is logged in, and then it does some authorization on top of it to see if they're admin, and it just dis dis dispatches functionality. Well, so, you know, where does this land on my continuum? You know, the, the developers had to remember to call functions. Okay, so does the SAPI make that easier? No. In fact, it looks exactly like the same amount of work. Right, so let's look at a SAPI and let's look at input validation and output validation. So this is Bank of Insecurities, our training app like WebGo that is graphed as a, as a tree map. And let's go through the process of fixing this application with a SAPI with respect to input validation and output encoding. Well, there's some files that I didn't have to touch. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, there's uh, three files that I called secondary action, meaning that they were basically vulnerable but not exploitable. Um, so you, know, you can have that argument on the pen test out call. Um, and then there was uh, some stuff I would take as secondary action because it wasn't very accessible, but it was exploitable. And then there was the code I had to change. Um, and so, uh, oh yeah, and if I wanted to go back to the auth stuff, I got to take those two classes too. So ultimately speaking, when I was done using a SAPI, which was going to fix my code, I had to change 70% of the files and 78% of the lines of code. If ever there were more epic fail, I'm not sure. It's like, that's like, you know, uh, Mr. Developer, you didn't write any of this code correctly, so here I'm going to give you a library, and uh, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to uh, get every one of the calls correct. So what you see here is you see that you have to pick the right method to call in each case, and you have to remember to call it, and you have to get all that right. So remember what I said a bad framework was, right? So what's the scorecard? Did I have to remember to call it? Yep. Did I have to remember to call it correctly? Yep. Did I have to remember to call it everywhere? Yep. Did I have to call the right one for the right reason? Yep. It's 0 for 4. If you use a SAPI for input validation output encoding and you use my framework rating scheme, you fail. Now, that's not to say that it can't help you with those things, and it's not to say there isn't good stuff in the SAPI. Remember what I'm saying is that we're not getting across the bridge of meeting the easy to use. Same thing is the case for crypto. Uh, I don't know what to say about this, it's sort of MIA, um, and of course, and on and on. Um, and so the moral of this story is we need to align the controls as closely with the convention that we're programming against in the framework designs as possible. So what kind of difference does this make? Well, let's go to um, you know, the, the ASAPI example here um, for the encoder that I just described, and let's compare that with, um, you know, JXT. Uh, and this is, this is an old slide, this, this content is all from the JXT website, um, but it's no loss project. So look at the difference in the amount of impact I've had on the developer, right? What I've done is I've gone from the API, which is the lowest level cable in my monster cable continuum, to I've gone to convention. In the, in the bottom case, what I have is I've asked the developer to adopt a particular convention of syntax, and they get the security cheese for free with it. 
And what's exciting about this too is that I've also gone from having to remember to call it to a circumstance where it's secure by default and I have to remember to disable it if I don't want it. So I've gone from API that you know I need to get those four things right with to convention that is secure by default. Yes. I think the I think the convention of sanitizing HTML HTML on input and then dumping it raw on output is a horribly bad convention. And I recommend we use the many sanitizers available to do that sanitization also on output in case data is manipulated during data flow. I'm splitting hairs with you, John. I'm yeah. not I'm not uh, warranting or uh, advocating. I'm simply using an example of the difference between APIs. But, but so I think, I think yes, one of the things I'm very excited about with OWASP is that this is a community that has finally turned the corner to realizing that output encoding is going to help them more than input validation in you know, this particular. But um, the point is that look at the difference to the developer, right? If you're a security guy and you're trying to sell the top, that's a tough sell. If you're a security guy trying to sell the bottom scenario, it's a better sell. And actually, we're going to get into, Jim, later, um, you know, whether or not uh, this is the right approach or not. So, so let's look at what the impact of this is on my bank of insecurities thing. we still got those two pieces that I don't care about. We've still got those secondary actions. Let's look at this for authentications purpose, not for input validations purpose. So what I had to do to fix it using, um, you know, uh, 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 the technique I adopted, which is, again, you know, pulling things in and, and using a, um, uh, a convention and oh, uh, OAD abstraction was, I had to write three more classes. I had to write an interceptor, uh, an auth strategy to handle some of my uh, authentication stuff, uh, pages 23 through 25 of Jim's book. And then I had to change the deployment descriptor. And what that did was it took um, all of, when you use the pen, it breaks your animations. Um, so what it did is it took these classes and it sucked the code I would have had to write out of those classes into the deployment descriptor. So I took what was custom code and it became a configuration change I had to make, make because I added these other classes, which then because of the use of the Spring Framework, I was able to weave into the code um, without having to ask the developer to code anything myself. Right? And so again, this, you know, what, we're, what we're after here is reducing the impact on developers, reducing the, the amount of difference between them coding securely and the So um, I didn't realize this is going to be a so I had to change five percent of the, uh, I'm sorry, five files or twelve percent of the code, right? And, and and I got my job done. So um, that's a toy app, okay? I mean, if you fixed authentication using the strategy I just provided and it changed twelve percent of your app, that, that would be wild. That's that's huge. That's a lot. Um, so you know, saying that I, I did a hundred percent remediation on these two issues on on a you know, ten thousand line app is, is not interesting, but. If you look at this paper by uh, Christoph Kern out of Google, um, you will see that he takes a very similar approach, and in fact, uh, does what Jim describes with respect to the output encoding strategy, and layers on a bit more than just the contextual we're output encoding, and hits an app with about a thousand uh, templates, and goes from 31 bugs to four, or an 87% reduction in vulnerability. Uh, in app, the second app, um, which they were at for less time, um, they went from 21 bugs to 9, or 57% reduction. Now remember my original stats, right? Remember 67% uh, re-exploit, 98% re-exploit, 100% re-exploit. I really, really, really like that number better, right? I just hit the 80 20 roll on that one. Now, depending on the kind of vulnerability I'm addressing, 80% less vulnerable sites may be 0% more secure. Let's be clear. But the point is I'm making a measurable impact. Okay, so this isn't just you know, art. This is actually you know, a, a simple and, and effective strategy. I was, uh, I, um, I was drawing this as a joke um, that, that in a discussion with the guys at Sonotype, who are really good guys, um, but when we talk about where we're going to put this framework, when we talk about how we're going to code securely, remember that you know we're really wound up about the code we're writing, but it's this little tip of the iceberg. You know, if, if you've got 200,000 lines of code, understand that in, in the Java world, you're probably building on about 2 million lines of open source that you drug in as jar files. And understand that the containers and the servers and that stuff you're sitting on are 20 million lines of code. Right? As you guys know, the security posture 
it doesn't matter which portion of the iceberg you know you strike, you're going down. Uh, and so, so you know, and that doesn't even count the fact that you call services, right? Uh, and so it turns out that when we look at you know the security functions, this, this approach we have, I'm going to write a security function and get it from developers. We have to remember that we're not just looking at this tip of the iceberg. We have to look much more um, deeply and far afield from that. And so, one of the most interesting things is if you don't want to think about, you know, whether it's an API call or a convention or those words, think about it this way: deciding where you're going to inject security into the process of the code. Uh, it's just a bunch of words that don't belong together. If you're going to decide where you're going to affect the security posture of your application, where is almost a more important question to answer than what? Um, this guidance over here, you can like or not like, it's from Kevin Wall's blog on how to use this app to get authentication right. So again, I don't warrant any of this, but uh, it's good because it's a Wall's guidance. Um, and so let's look at the application you know, uh, architecture du jour in, uh, in Java. You've got uh, Shiteminder out here protecting your app in terms of authentication. You've got some network gear, presumably scaling you up and doing encryption. And you've got some foo that, you know, produces um, uh, functionality. And so if I ask, how am I going to take Kevin's advice uh, on not restricting password length? Well, I may put that in policy here and here. I may not ask the developer to touch that at all. Right? If I'm going to ask them not to restrict character sets, I may actually change the way their interceptor handles that form submission. Uh, I may put some stuff on the client to help the user with experience there. Uh, and so on and so forth. Each of these things goes in different places. If we only think about security as APIs, we're going to stick it all in functions and then we're going to force the developer to somehow jam all that stuff in here where it may not belong. And that's not a good idea. So, Figuring out where you're going to put a fix really determines the extent to which that fix is going to have an impact on the posture, and it really drives a dramatic difference in level of effort uh, and your ability to interact with other systems uh, and get that regression uh, or, or that the, the fix. So I've been talking about security frameworks, but I've, I've really been um, really been striking at uh, you know what what kind of bad ideas are and, and kind of what criteria for good ideas are. So. What, what does your security framework look like? Like, is it, is it, is it a box? Can you ship it out to, can you put it in, in Git? What, what do you do? Um, I'm a firm believer in something like a napkin. Um, those of you who have seen me speak over, over the ages about threat modeling know um, I'm literally obsessed with patterns. Um, and, you know, it's simple, right? When we use development frameworks, those development frameworks are really excited to tell you about the nifty pattern they implement. Like, this is a model view controller. This is a model view model you know, view. And so take their lovely, very proud documentation on what developer framework is providing developer and ask yourself, what does security need to think about while that's happening? So when you, you download your, you know, your, your web view component, uh, it's going to talk about, you know, um, it's going to talk about rendering apps data and collecting user input, and you think it's a security person. I may want to filter that data. You know? And when you look at its controller logic and it talks about navigation and flow and dispatching business logic, you may think, I actually need to make sure that people can get to those places they want to get to, and I want to make sure that they, you know, they, they, the, the data is filtered. Well, wait a minute. You know, should I be filtering the data in both places? Well, well yeah, maybe, because when you implement a view, that's what the user sees. And when the user sees an entry for a telephone number or some other field, you do want to give them information about how that input should be formatted. That's about user experience. But on the server and the controller, that's about trust. And so just writing out in an app what the developer frameworks are supposed to be providing the developers and what responsibilities come along with that from a security perspective is going to tell you what you're going to do right, to, in your security framework. You can get down to the component level, um, and I have for a lot of the Java frameworks, so if you're, if you're in the mood to talk about that specifically, you can drive down to the component level. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, if you're a security person, an auditor, a, an assessor, you may just look at it as a checklist. You may ask yourself, what does the developer have 
to, to build these web values. What does the developer have to build authentication? What does the developer have to do authentication? And you may make your laundry list, and what you need is an answer to all of these questions. But don't go out and write a function for each of those things that you need, or each of those design components. Let's think about where we can place this capability inside of the whole iceberg of software that we're deploying. And let's think about as frictionless a way to put it in those different places as we can. Um, if you're an architect and not looking at this washed out slide here, uh, you could take that laundry list of security controls and you can break it down into each uh, little um, item. So for instance, you know, to do authorization, you need to have a notion of identity and you need to authenticate and you need to have access control lists. And so each of those things in our laundry list is going to break out into a lot of different things we've got to get right. And what we can do is we can look at how each of those things would best place itself in the architecture. Um, and so a lot of, and, and this is a scrubbed example from um, a customer architecture that I worked on, but you know, this is their app, and think of it as an iceberg. This top black line here is where, um, where the custom application code is. It's the stuff that they wrote. And remember, so I have even listed there, you know, the developer has all kinds of responsibilities. Like, they, anything I put up here, they have to remember to call, they have to call it correctly, and so on and so forth. Down here in the, in the shared components, those are things that, you know, uh, they don't have to remember to call. They're just in the architecture, and the components that they're using extend those components. And then, of course, down here in the platform is all the stuff they get for free. And so, what I've seen architects and organizations do is take their laundry list, and then plug it into their architecture and say, okay, I've got a story about how I'm going to do authentication. I've got a story about how I'm doing authorization. I've got a story about how I'm doing password storage and so on and so forth. And my job is to push that stuff down as much as I can. If you're into checklists, you can do it this way. Right? Um, one of the things we've started to see organizations do is they've got their laundry list of security concerns. These are obviously at the super high level. You wouldn't do it at this level. You'd start at this level, but I mean, obviously there's a ton of things that handle authentication. And maybe you have domains in which people are programming. Uh, and so you want to look at your framework and ask yourself, um, yeah, I have no story in terms of the database here. I got no way to provide the developer anything in terms of authentication authorization or cryptography, right? What that means is that the developers are on their own doing whatever it is that they're doing. Uh, now, okay, maybe on the mobile front, I've got, you know, some things I can provide them in terms of cryptography. <coughs> maybe I've got that integrated with the iOS platform really well. Maybe I've got some, some secure code and guidance for Android. Maybe I'm screwed on phone gap in these things because I don't know how to get that right. Um, you know, I may have a tokenization service which I feel comfortable about, but they have to remember to call it. So it's kind of green. If I've got stuff baked into my default configuration on Spring and I got authorization from it for free, maybe that's deep green and I don't even have to code review for it. Right? Um, because I know that it's just going to be in the package that they get when they start developing. Um, so what we've seen organizations do is take these very different views and take the ones most comfortable to them and start to inventory what services, what APIs, what frameworks they're providing developers, um, and basically getting to the point over time where none of the boxes are read, where they have a story. Now, that story may be the good cable, right? It may be something they have to remember to call up here as a developer, but they work it in over time uh, to make it make it more, more automatic, more, um, more frictionless. Um, I started this, actually, this next slide is a joke. Um, but it turns out it's not a joke. Um, I said, you know, if, if, if this is not your thing and this is not your thing, um, why don't you just take those ridiculously high-level architecture diagrams you got for your apps, your web apps, and why don't you just slap logos of stuff you want the developers to use in the places you want them to use them? And then they can ask themselves when they're developing, like, uh, have I used the Spring security stuff? Have I used Mustache? because the security guys are going to expect it, or they're providing me help in how to do that. Uh, 
this is, I mean, I don't even know what to say about this. This, this is horrible, but it seemed very useful to people as an awareness tool, as an outreach tool. Um, if you're part of a bigger enterprise, you may actually have, you know, different sets of people that are taking this framework from something they didn't know us we thought it was an API, the whole way up to secure middleware, uh, messaging services. Um, that basically are handling both channel and message level security, that are handling message signing, that are passing um, uh, authorization capability back and forth through SAML. You may have defensive services um, uh, that, you know, uh, that are handling logging, monitoring response. Uh, you may have enabling services, things like tokenization, authentication, authorization, uh, that you're providing as products for people. Um, I've gone through a bunch of different views of the same problem, but this need not be art. Um, you know, every time I start uh, talking about security frameworks, I sort of imagine like Johnny Ives, like really proud of that next thing. You know, it's so this is so glorious. It's like a half a millimeter thing. It doesn't have to be art. We don't have to have it perfect. Don't fret about picking the fanciest widget. Should you be using this output encoding scheme or this other one? Again, I. I don't have anything to sell you. Um, instead, go through your own organization's code. Um, someone has probably done something really well. And uh, it works in the organization because it's already deployed working in the organization. You know, um, I've seen many security uh, uh, consultant fillet when they come into an organization and they explain, well, you know, you're using OWASP to SAPI and you need to use JavaScript. Why? Why are you going to force them to switch courses? Uh, is there a compelling reason? Does it get them off that value chain where it's more frictionless? If you can't answer those questions, then why would you have them switch? My favorite stat from the code review over the last 10 or so years is that for every 100,000 lines of code, I expect to see six unique input validation functions that are formed in. So, you know, a thousand monkeys typing on typewriters will eventually create Shakespeare. Somewhere within your organization, there's a really good input validation. Somewhere within your organization, there's a really great authorization strategy. Somewhere in your organization, there's a really great abstraction for parameterizing the purpose. Fine. Radical idea, change your code review process from one where you find bugs to one where you pull out really interesting stuff and make that part of your framework. There are piece parts at first that are odd bits. But when I say that organizations have been successful, um, and when I say that you know this is something that they've um, how does one use PowerPoint? Organizations that have said we've been really successful by building a security framework do not have a jar file in the API. They have a framework that's more like that hodgepodge of logos, and they've culled those from their own organization, they've sucked them, and they don't have to be custom code, they can be, um, you know, yeah. uh, uh, open source or, or, or vendor products successfully used or whatever, uh, and they've changed their secure coding guidance from Jim's book on how to do everything right in Java to um, here's how to pull down the repo of the guys in this other business unit that did this whole um, you know, uh, key migration thing really well. Uh, so their secure coding guidance becomes not about how to do everything right, but about how to get the thing done faster by using what someone else in the organization has already succeeded in doing, and that we've hardened or that we've proven is hard because we've assessed it. And so the secure coding guidance becomes about, you know, using the right tools in the right places, as opposed to how to do everything right. Um, I've written a ton on how to store passwords securely. You may love it, you may hate it. Uh, I don't care, but probably <laughs> you need to solve that problem not in every day, but a few times in, in your organization. And once it's solved, the other teams don't need to have the same set of arguments. Shamelessly copy and steal it. The organization should have a framework. And if you have B-Crypt tattooed on your chest, that may be the way to do it. If you have another way, it passes muster that may be the way to do it. So 
calling these things from your own um, organization, figuring out where, what strategy you're going to use to put them in place. Um, that was lost. And then remembering this uh, hierarchy of how we're going to uh, make it easier to apply these things from custom code to code that's abstracted underneath the custom code to services that we've pulled out to configuration of those services that hides all that implementation to convention in the very languages and frameworks you're using to platform provided stuff that can't be screwed up um, is going to be very powerful. And the organizations that I've seen eradicate problems have taken that strategy where they have stolen the, the good work of their own teams, selected it based on this preference, and then built their assessment practices to help govern the use uh, of those of those pieces of the framework. So um, that's my story, and um, I have written a lot on this. Uh, I'm going to continue to write a lot more on it. Um, uh, in terms of how to think about this, how to talk to developers, um, how to steal their guidance and, and use it in other teams. Um, but remember that um, there are more problems that your security framework needs to solve than cross-site scripting. You may want to start with cross-site scripting because there's a lot of findings in the assessment reports. Um, it's a very endemic, very systemic problem that is, that is born out of the tragedy of the tools we're using for the web. There are other problems that we find in every assessment. We have never encountered an organization where we went, son of a bitch, they saw their passwords really securely. <laughs> Game over. I just, we've never seen an organization that does a Java application development platform with single sign-on that gets log out correct in a way that prevents basically um, uh, horizontal privilege escalation. So, and again, I'm going to talk about some of these things that I said, but there are a ton of different security problems that are in that flaw space that I should be, that are beyond those top three that you can solve once in the framework and move on. And this is how we're going to defeat the hamster wheel of pain of finding 50 cross-site scriptings, finding them again, finding them again, suggesting a sappy. So happy to take questions, happy to take claims, um, happy to help. But again, uh, it's it's. I don't think it's about outside help. I really think when David, when Ken, when these guys tell you about their program and how they were able to build it, and they talk about getting involved with development, I think if you ask them, you'll start you'll start to hear that they're doing these things. They're looking for those good solutions. They're baking those solutions in where they're frictionless, not an act to other teams and they're spreading that learning and that ease, and they're getting successes because of it. I challenge all of you to do the same thing. Um, it's what I work on most days with my customers, and it's really hard, um, and you have to live in depth to do it, but the bugs do go down, and that's really satisfying. Thanks. How long does the security guy get to keep his job if he actually uses the big red question? Um, so, uh, okay, so I know two guys um, who work uh, in organizations where they are the guy that has the hidden button. Um, I know that the button has been pressed five times. Uh, three times in the morning, twice in the morning, and that person In both cases, they're done. Um, what's interesting about that narrative idea of those three points, when you get a button, and when that button goes the whole way up to the CEO level, so that you know, the CEO will believe when you press the button the software should not go and no one gets to the right. That means you've done these other things to the point where you've ingratiated yourself with development, to the point where